We live in a fundamentally unhappy time. Modern life and modern culture have led many to be profoundly unhappy and to seek happiness in many directions. How do we truly find happiness? That's what we're going to talk about today on the podcast. Hello, I'm Eric Sam, your host, editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, I just want to encourage people to hit the like button, to subscribe to the channel, let other people know about what we're doing here. Also, you can subscribe to our email newsletter. Just go to crisismagazine.com and fill in your email address, and you'll be subscribed to our newsletter. Uh, you can also follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. Okay, so today we have a great guest today. I'm very excited about this, uh, Father Robert Spitzer. He is the founder and president of the Magus Center, which is an excellent organization. We're not going to talk about it very much today, but I just want to recommend people to it uh, very highly. He's a scholar, a teacher, an author, and a seasoned leader. He is a preeminent theologian and philosopher specializing in the philosophy of science. His other areas of expertise are ethics and leadership. He's the author of many books, but the one we're going to talk about today is one of his most recent ones, which is The Four Levels of Happiness, Your Path to Personal Flourishing from Sophia Institute Press. Welcome to the program, Father. It's great to be with you again, Eric. Thank you. So we're going to talk about this book, but I, I have to just ask you first to just, Magus Center is, is doing great work. Could you just give us a brief kind of, for people who might not have heard of it, Maybe give us a brief kind of overview of what 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 it is that the Magus Center is doing. Sure, um, magus in, in in Latin means the even more, and so uh, we really wanted to, uh, you know, answer a question and a need that is going on in the Catholic Church for the last fifteen years. In other words, the precipitous drop uh, in our young people from not only the Catholic Church. Uh, but belief in God altogether. So, you know, when the Pew survey came out and then the next, the Cara survey, predicting that about 50% of our church-going young uh, people would leave the church and belief in God by the time they got to their second or third year of college. Um, it, you know, I mean, that's a, a, a real problem of historical proportions. I mean, 50% is a lot of kids. And more than that, they identified two principal reasons why this was occurring. Number one, the belief, and of course this is a mistaken belief, that there is no evidence for God or Jesus, life after death, or the church. They believe there's no scientific or rational evidence of any kind. And they might have learned about the proofs of God in, in high school but or middle school, but I don't think they did. They're leaving in, in droves. And secondly, um, they believe that faith and science are in conflict. And because um, science is truth, faith must be, a, a, you know, obviously some kind of a, a myth. And they, uh, they seem to think that, well, it can be summarily ignored or actually rejected. And so this is a problem. It needed to be met when I was president up at Gonzaga University. Uh, for 11 years, I, I could see this, you know, I was teaching classes of, um, you know, over 100 kids um, would be in my classes, on, um, you know, the evidence for God from science. And I knew this was going to come down the pipe way before the Pew survey started uh, measuring it. But I mean, it came in 2012, 2015, 2018. So this is no news. But the real thing that just uh, um, uh, uh, the real thing that got to me um, was the fact that um, uh, the, the very moment Pew is looking at all of our kids, you know, leaving the church and believe in God, the scientists are believing in God more and more. So the Pew survey did uh, um, a, a big study uh, from the American Association for the Advancement of Science on where scientists are today. And they determined that 51% of scientists overall um, said that they were believers in God or a higher transcendent power. And 21% um, agnostics, about 20% atheists. But the young scientists was the really interesting one. These are 35 and younger um, scientists. Those scientists, 66%, a super majority, said they were believers in God or a higher transcendent power, about 15% agnostic, 15% atheist. Um, and then you look at the physicians, 76%, that's over three quarters of physicians, 
uh, believe in God or a higher transcendent power. Only 12.5% are agnostics and 11.2% are atheists. So you look at that and you go, how can our young people be, you know, zooming out the door, believing that most scientists are atheists, believing that there's no evidence for God, uh, life after death, or Jesus, believing that faith and science are in conflict, while all these scientists, and especially the young scientists, are moving toward God. And uh, finally, you know, I decided in conjunction with some uh, partners, um, you know, uh, uh, Timothy Bush and a variety of other people, to start the Maja Center to address this specifically, and that's what we did. I came down um, to the Magis uh, Center. I came down here to Orange County and then um, worked on this uh, problem through the Magis Center um, since 2009. So anyway, um, we've been all this time preparing high school curricula. We do this through Sophia. So we're gonna have, uh, we have a, a middle school curriculum, a middle school uh, program. We also have a high school program for senior year elective um, in this area of the Catholic faith and science. Uh, Sophia is currently now integrating our um, program, uh, all of our material with their curriculum for fifth through 11th grades. So through in fifth through 11th grades, all the kids will be taking every year uh, the evidence of God, life after death, um, you know, Jesus, et cetera, to, you know, age appropriate, uh, answering questions that the you know, common questions that they have. So, um, uh, you know, I just decided not just to make the high school stuff, we wanted to put this into parish programs and we have a parish program. Now, you know, mostly it gets implemented in men's groups. Uh, we're now doing a faith and science retreat, a weekend retreat for young people that can be integrated into confirmation classes and, uh, and uh, into um, uh, youth ministries. And if you go to magiscenter.com, M-A-G-I-S center.com, um, you can actually uh, take a look at this. We also have plenty of free material on that website. Uh, if anybody wants to download those essential modules and show them to their young people, um, that would be great. We also have scholarly articles there free of charge. And of course, uh, I've written 18 books. So, um, you know, uh, that, that you'd have to pay for, but there's plenty of articles free of charge, lots of videos on this material free of charge on modulacenter.com. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm glad that you did that overview because I want people who aren't familiar with it to, to understand what, what's going on with it and uh, a lot of the help it's doing of really helping, particularly young people, understand that there is not a conflict between true science and true faith. And I think that's the, that's the key here. So we've talked about that on this yeah. podcast a few times. So now I want to really now focus so more on this book you've written, this most recent book, uh, The Four Levels of Happiness. And I, I said at the beginning, I think most people understand that we live in a profoundly unhappy time, meaning yeah. if you go beyond the surface of maybe Instagram, most people realize that most people are just unhappy. And so why do you think that is, Father, that so many people today seem to be unhappy? Yeah, I'm just going to go right to that Statistica survey that I think just came out about a week ago that said, you know, Americans are more pessimistic than ever before about uh, life and their future, the country, et cetera. If you look at that, I mean, if you want statistical evidence, there it is. And then we have known that there have been two major surveys that have been done by professional uh, psychiatric associations showing um, that over the last 10 years, major depressive disorder, this is a, among our young people, that would be between 15 to 25 years of age, in just 10 years, the major depressive uh, disorder has double. So it went up from 8% 10 years ago to 16% today. And then um, on top of that, we can see that the um, uh, depression, uh, the um, uh, um, anxiety and depression rate uh, for the overall population um, has doubled in the last 10 years. Suicides and suicidal contemplation has doubled over the last um, 12 years. So uh, uh, among the same population of young people, but this also extends over into young adults 
they don't have as high a rate increase in um, you know, substance abuse, suicide, suicidal contemplation, um, anxiety and depression as the 15 to 25 year olds, but um, uh, they do also have a significant increase. So the millennials are not going to, to escape the fate of the Gen Zs. So for all intents and purposes, statistical evidence shows now that um, we are in a, a really, really a tragic situation, if I can uh, put it that way, because truly, I mean, never before uh, in our history have we even come close to having like 30% of our population experiencing significant depression and anxiety. I mean, th this is bad. And, and so we, um, you know, I mean, even the, the ethical, um, you know, belief in objective standards of ethics, or just even in the recent Gallup polls that, you know, ask Americans, well, what do you think that um, uh, your fellow Americans are like morally when you have um, in the majority of Americans saying that most other Americans have poor morals? I rest my case. There's not going to be any trust in that culture. I mean, it, we are ready for division. We think that people will exploit us at the drop of the hat. We don't trust them. We don't trust that they have any objective moral standard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, people have abandoned, well, our young people, our millennials have abandoned religion uh, in unprecedented, unprecedented rates. And at the very same time, the depression, anxiety, suicide, suicidal contemplation, substance abuse, familial tensions, um, and major depressive disorder have just skyrocketed uh, over a 100% increase in just 10 years. So, I mean, a doubling in just um, uh, 10 years. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it, you know, the scenario though, it all makes sense because there's a very high correlation between religion and happiness. A very high correlation between religion and the absence of depression and anxiety. So um, a, a very big study was done by the American Psychiatric Association Longitudinal Study in 2004 by Kanita Dervik and uh, I think about seven other people. Um, but in that study, they compared non-religiously affiliated people to religiously affiliated people. Non-religiously affiliated people, those who uh, the Pew survey would call a nun, N-O-N-E, uh, the nuns actually had much, much higher rates of depression, anxiety, just what we were talking about, suicide, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, familial tensions, and antisocial aggressivity. I mean, it's like, hey, this is exactly what we're noticing in young people. Young people's religious commitment declines, um, and then we can see this huge increase in depression, anxiety, and suicides. And at the very same time, we've got this study from the American Psychiatric Association that says, hey, you know, non-religiously affiliated people have, you know, a doubling of, of depression, anxiety, suicide, and suicidal contemplation, et cetera. You look at these things and you go, I think I get it. And furthermore, uh, the emotional health in general of um, non-religiously affiliated people is uh, lower, significantly lower than religiously affiliated people. They feel much less emptiness, alienation, loneliness, malaise, and guilt. But more than that, religiously affiliated people have a kind of a, a mooring in the absolute, a hope in an eternal future a belief that there really is a perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and uh, home out there, and some intuition that that God of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home is present to them. You put all these things together, and it translates into significantly lower rates of depression, anxiety, suicides, suicidal contemplation, substance abuse, etc. So I'm just I put it right out there, and I have these statistics. Uh, and the various, uh, the six studies that actually show these correlations um, of religious people being happier, looking at the decline of religion, 
and at the very same time, a huge increase in depression and anxiety and suicides. Um, and um, it's not just that, it, there's another thing called ego comparative happiness, what I call level two happiness. And with Instagram and social media, X and TikTok, et cetera, with the, you know, the constant checking of these things and the kind of narcissistic underpinning of these things, you know, how many likes do I have? Do people really appreciate me? Oh my gosh, this guy doesn't like me. And constant checking, this has really exacerbated the depression levels. And that's why you have so much major depressive disorder increase. Uh, a lot of this is due to what I call very enhanced ego comparative happiness, level two happiness. And um, it's just pushed uh, at them by, like I said, social media of various kinds. And so um, uh, my formula, uh, frankly, in the, in the long run is we got to first <laughs> increase the religious commitment. And I don't mean just sitting around in my room going, I'm a spiritual person and I pray and have faith. That won't do it. Religion means belonging and practicing within a religious community. That's what pushes down the, um, the uh, uh, depression, anxiety, and suicide statistics. That's what gives this positive sense of being moored in something absolute and perfect, perfectly true, loving, and just, or good, and at the same time, uh, of having a hope in an eternal uh, future, and in a sense of having some kind of an absolute dignity and destiny and fulfillment um, within one's reach. Uh, all of these things, um, the positive side and the negative side, are uh, actually proven by studies. So I think um, practicing within a religious community is the first step uh, toward um, emotional health and getting the, uh, you know, some kind of detachment, at least cutting in half the uh, social media usage because underlying social media is this level two stuff. Who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who's got more power? Who's got less power? Who's more intelligent? Who's less intelligent? You know, who's more popular? Who's less popular? Powerful, less powerful, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these are the questions of level two ego comparative identity people. And if that's all you care about day and night, and if that's where you think your success is going to happen, that's as true quality of life is, this is the meaning of your life. Get ready for depression, fear of failure, fear of loss of esteem, anxiety, narcissism, emptiness that comes with narcissism, ego rage, ego blame, self-pity, jealousy, and a variety of other things that make our lives perfectly miserable. Decrease level two ego comparative happiness, increase level four uh, religious happiness, and eventually uh, you will not only be happier in this lifetime, I think you will find yourself on a, a very strong pathway to eternal life as well. Yeah, I, I want to break down in a minute these different levels because I think yeah. there's a lot there's a lot there that I think really help us to understand. Because when I was going through the book, I thought the same thing. I was like, okay, understanding this. But before I do that, I, I just I think for some people, maybe not religious people as much, but some people, the fact that we're so unhappy today is almost counterintuitive because for decades now we've been given ways to supposedly make us more happy. We have less work to do around the house, for example. We mm -hmm. have things are easier. Uh, we can buy any, we can get almost any type of food we want to at any time, very easily, usually cheaply. We can buy lots of different um, things, hobbies or, or just things for a house, what, you know, whatever the case may be. There's all these things that are geared towards, at least if you listen to the commercials, <laughs> making yeah. us happy. Yeah. And so why is it that literally at a time where we have a million and one things that supposedly make us happy that we're actually unhappy. It seems like there's an inverse relationship, but why is that? Because all the things that Madison Avenue promises will make you happy are not making you happy. <laughs> and uh, they're not only not making you happy, they're making you more unhappy. They're making you more level two ego comparative or more level one materialistic and pleasure happiness oriented. So in other words, <clears throat> Madison Avenue serves Madison Avenue. 
They serve the marketing community. They're there to sell products. That's their deal. And, you know, I mean, that's a legitimate deal. If you want to do that, fine. But I would not go to Madison Avenue to find out what will make you happy objectively. I mean, uh, first of all, I think if you're a, a dedicated religious person, you will know what makes you happy ultimately and even what makes you happier on this earth, namely your relationship with God through your religious community. For me, it would be the Catholic Church. Now, I, I would say also, if you if that's not what uh, convinces you, then the, I think you really ought to go to the archives of general psychiatry and look at uh, some of the articles and the studies that I have been citing. Um, uh, by the way, in the book there, I have these studies already cited, so you can um, just uh, look at them in the footnotes there and uh, see the studies uh, for yourself. But I think the studies show conclusively that, um, uh, the, you know, ego comparative happiness is not going to do it for you. Um, but ego comparative happiness will sell products like mad for Madison Avenue. And religious happiness will do it for you. Contributive happiness, which is level three happiness, will do it for you. But unfortunately, contributive happiness and faith-based happiness is not going to sell a lot of products. So, I mean, it's it's basically not going to be of great interest to in Madison Avenue. So my one thought is, hey, who's forming the popular culture out there? Well, yes, there's a lot of academics that have influence, but let's face it. Uh, you know, I don't want to blame everything on on uh, Madison Avenue, I, far from it. I think you've got a lot of people in the digital media world who definitely want to plug ego comparative happiness. Hey, that's what sells Instagram. That's what sells X. That's what sells TikTok. You know, I mean, no problem. Let's, you know, let's push that form of happiness. Religion, religious happiness, even though it is the most fulfilling, both in the present and, of course, we believe ultimately and eternally, I mean, that's not going to push Instagram. You know, I mean, there are religious websites. They do get a lot of following. But, I mean, and, and I think uh, they're very important. But the ones that cater to, you know, you're going to look beautiful, more beautiful than other people. Or the ones that cater to, hey, you know, you're going to be at the right parties with the right people. I mean, uh, I, I hate to say it, but maybe the priests aren't the right people or maybe... You know, the, uh, the people who uh, are part of your Bible uh, group are not the right people. I mean, uh, let's face facts. That's, those are not the winners uh, in the culture. That's not going to sell Instagram. I mean, there's a lot of ones, too, that, hey, I, you know, well, you can belong to a Mensa Society. Just take a few of these uh, courses from us, and you will be considered intelligent by all. And there's a lot of them, you know, how to get power and promotion and ten easy life. Hey, you know, that's what sells. My one thought is, you know, of course, uh, you know, I'm not blaming it on Instagram. I'm not blaming it on Madison Avenue. I just think there is a cultural problem. And you say, well, what came first, the culture or Madison Avenue and, um, and uh, uh, Instagram and social media, et cetera? Well, to be honest with you, it's a chicken and egg deal. Because after World War II, uh, as our technological capacity increased and our material welfare, our GDP increased considerably, you can see that this became of greater and greater interest to the American public. So, you know, that, that has become a, a very important dimension of our lives. And as that happened, as ego comparative and materialistic and pleasure happiness level one level two became more popular you can see that level uh, uh four religious happiness has decreased level three uh contributive happiness has decreased slightly but it's staying kind of you know on a good line and a lot of our younger people do have a very strong sense of contributive happiness um, at least they have feelings of contributive happiness and some of them actually get out there and do a lot of service as well. So that one is still uh, intact to some degree, uh, but uh, religious happiness has fallen considerably. At the same time, ego comparative and materialistic pleasure happiness has gone up. So um, the main thing is, uh, you know, well, did that stoke Madison Avenue? Absolutely. Madison Avenue takes its cue from what sells. And did that stoke Instagram? 
And I mean, so Facebook started as definitely an ego comparative deal. I mean, that's what it's all about. I want to show you my life and how successful and what a good guy I am. And I want you to like me. Give me a lot of likes. Okay. And so forth. And, and of course, Instagram, that's its lifeblood is coming from ego comparative happiness. So I would say that our interests since World War II and more materialistic and ego comparative happiness, that has stoked Madison Avenue and, and uh, the social media uh, groups um, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, to, hey, let's get going. There's profits to be made here. And then, of course, once they do that, why, it obviously increases the level of interest in level two ego comparative happiness. And that, in turn, increases social media use and Madison Avenue, uh, use of Madison Avenue um, promoted products. And it just goes right around in a vicious, ever-increasing, ongoing spiral or you know, that, that just continues to spiral out and grow and grow and grow. So uh, um, that's. Yeah. If you had these four. Yeah. So you have these four levels that you call each happiness, the first materialistic, then you have yeah. ego comparative, then you have the contributive and then you finally have the religious. Would you say then that the first you're calling them all happiness. So can the first two, the materialistic, I, I kind of can think that the materialistic and you comparative, there's a level in which that's not unhealthy in the sense that obviously if you're completely destitute, you have nothing, you're going to be more, you're actually going to be more legitimately happy. If you can feed yourself, have some material, you can clothe yourself. Same with the ego comparative. There's some level, which it's good to be uh, accepted by people around you, for example. So yeah. how, how, what's kind of the difference between an unhealthy level on those first two levels and a healthy uh, level of happiness? Yeah, sure. Let me just give both your questions. First, yeah, they, they are all called happiness in English, uh, but you know, for um, you know somebody like Saint Augustine or Saint Thomas Aquinas, they have four Latin words for it, which we really don't. We just have having happiness. But you know, happiness one, uh, which is a materialistic pleasure one, that was called litus, L-A-E-T-U-S, and then of course uh, level two, uh, the Latin name for ego comparative happiness was felix, F-E-L-I-X. Um, from which we get the word felicity, so there's something there uh, in English. And then beatus was level three, contributive happiness. That's uh, where Jesus is calling, right, beate tudo is translated in Latin, right? But it comes from the root beatus, which is a contributive happiness. And then sublimitas, right, that's the, uh, like, joy or gaude or sublimitas would be level four happiness. Now, the... The problem is in English, you've got happiness, 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 which of course is uh, going to lead to a world of confusion, uh, not certainly for just for our young people, but for our adults. So then getting to your second question, uh, what about the unhealthy parts of it? Absolutely. I mean, God created us with these desires and happiness is essentially um, the fulfillment of a desire, right? So, you know, we have desires for material uh, uh, well-being and for a pleasure, like the pleasure that can be taken from a good wine or a bowl of linguine or a steak or, you know, feeling German engineering in my car. So do you need some degree of that? Of course we do. If we didn't have that sense, we wouldn't eat. We wouldn't seek shelter. We wouldn't work and exert effort in order to, you know, build a home and to shelter our families. So we need these desires. But the point is, is, well, once, you know, the old thing my mom used to say, well, <clears throat> are you eating to live or are you living to eat? You know, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and I'd always have to say uh, every once in a while, well, yeah, maybe I'm <laughs> living to eat. You know, and when you get to the living to eat stage, that would be unhealthy. So what we in order to distinguish, just think of it this way. If you are just at, want a modicum of level one happiness, material and pleasure and happiness, in order uh, to you know uh, sustain yourself, to have you know, so you're not suffering from wind and cold, you're you're comfortable, your family's comfortable, and you have the capacity to advance yourself in life, that's good. But if you're living for material happiness, 
to have the best car in the whole neighborhood, the best car in Orange County or whatever it is. If that's what you're living for, if you're living for a great bottle of wine, etc., as an end in itself, then um, that is a very unhealthy form of level one happiness. It can never bring you the absolute. It can never bring you ultimate fulfillment <clears throat> in life. God didn't create you for that. But secondly, ego comparative happiness. Of course, we need ego comparative happiness. We have to compare ourselves to others. We have to make sure that we're doing a competent job, that we are competitive on the job, that we're competitive enough not to, to run in fear from our those who want to compete with us, right? That we <clears throat> are willing to exert the effort, the courage, the fortitude to not only be competitive, but excellent. <clears throat> and that's a very good thing. But when you start living for level two happiness, ego comparative happiness, who's achieving more, who's achieving less. I'm living for this as an as an end in itself. I'm achieving more than all you bums. And that's what makes me happy. If that's what we're doing, then we're in trouble. Because just on the other side of that is emptiness, alienation, loneliness, fear of failure, fear of loss of esteem, inferiority, superiority, jealousy, depression, anxiety, ego rage, ego blame, contempt of others, etc. You're gonna, in other words, you're gonna get a ton of payback um, uh, material. And I give this talk, by the way, to people who are in seventh and eighth grade, not just people who are in high school or college or in professional lives. When I give this talk, those kids recognize right away, oh, that's me. I'm the guy uh, who's doing all these things. And I, I maybe I am living for, you know, being the highest achiever or the most status or the most popularity or the most uh, recognition or the most power, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe I am living to be the recognized winner instead of the recognized loser. So they can see, you know, the depression, anxiety, and fear and all that in the wake of, um, you know, just making level two and then in itself. So there is a healthy level, absolutely, but there's a very unhealthy level. Now, level three, two, you'd think, well, contributive, uh, there must be a healthy and an unhealthy level there, too. And there is, as a matter of fact. So for, you know, contribution to others, I mean, I, I can tell you right now, when I'm making an optimal positive contribution or trying to make an optimal positive contribution to my family or to my friends or to my parishioners or to the community around me, um, you know, maybe to a community organization or to my church or to the kingdom of God or to, well, if I'm so lucky, the society or the culture, etc. If I'm trying to make an optimal positive difference, man, when I'm having a good influence and I'm doing something good for somebody and you know, somebody says, gosh, you've just made my life better. Thank you so much for, you know, exerting yourself. You didn't have to, and you did. And my life is so much better because of it. You took the time to write this note or to do this thing or uh, to help me out when I you know, really was in need, whatever the case is. You can get hooked on it. And, of course, you can get so hooked on it, you can start, again, thinking that this is ultimate happiness, that there is nothing else but really trying to be good for other people, to other people. But as Aristotle said a long time ago, and of course this is certainly holds in the Catholic and Christian traditions, right? You can certainly see you are an ultimatizer. Plato said deep within us, all of us yearn for these transcendentals. We don't want just some truth. We want perfect truth, the complete set of correct answers to the complete set of questions. I have these nieces, you know, uh, uh, that when they were little kids, you know, they just walk up to me and go, Uncle Bobby, why is this? And I say, well, because of that. But why is that? Well, because of that. But why is that? And finally you have to go time out because you're in the deepest notes of quantum theory. I mean, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're like, you know, they're going to keep going because they really do want to know. And they've got this instinct that you haven't given them everything yet, that there has to be another answer 
beyond what you have said and, and so forth. And again, my little nieces, you know, they could, you know, sit on my lap when they were kids and they would look into your eyes. Oh, they would look to see if your love was authentic, that you really love them. And you go, well, nobody taught those kids how to figure out when your love is kind of authentic or when you're just sort of going through the motions, but they know. It's almost like they got this sixth sense. They want perfect love. They don't want just some love. And the same thing, you remember, um, you probably have kids, you know, yeah. and you know, they're 10 years old and they, they figure out, hey, dad just did something that wasn't perfectly fair. <laughs> and you remember how the, the reaction is, right? <laughs> With the lower lip extended, that's not fair. As if the entire, you know, world is coming to an end. Uh, you know, at, the, at this moment. Well, they do experiencing it, that, experience it that way. There's something in them that expects this kind of perfect fairness. Not just perfect truth and love. They want perfect fairness. And they want a perfect home, too. They really do. They know that this is not, you know, you know the perfect home. There's, there's something about this world where they don't fit in, where they're out of kilter, where there is darkness out there. I mean, every kid, you don't have to tell every, any kid there's a boogeyman out there. Ha, it's just implacably within their subconscious mind. They know there's evil. Even there's a principle uh, of, of personalized evil out there. They may call it different names of different cultures, but boogeyman is ours. And you can pretty much say, that guy is evil. He's got the vapid look in his eyes, and he means you no good. Now, you of course, parents will say, now, 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 you know, there's no boogeyman under your bed. I just checked. You're fine. You know, everything else. But where did they get that from? Certainly not from their parents, right? There's something inside them that has a sense that there is something. But they also have a sense of God. They have a sense that there's something good out there beyond themselves and so forth. My point is, of course, we definitely are born into the world, as Aristotle would say, with the desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. We're born into the world with a sense that we're caught up in some kind of cosmic struggle between cosmic good and cosmic evil, right? In other words, that there are some higher powers of good and evil out there, and we're caught up in this. And the vast majority of kids who are not sociopathic, you know, we'll basically say, well, you know, I want to be a hero. I want to be on the side of perfect good. And I don't want to be on the side of, you know, the spiritual evil and uh, so forth and so on. So we're born into the world with that. But even if, uh, you know, Rudolf Otto and his group are correct in that great classic, the idea of, of the holy, um, in there, you know, he talks about the numinous experience that, we really do have a sense of a mysterious and fascinating, uh, you know, creator kind of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, energizing, inviting, but awesomely beyond us being that's interiorly present to us. All of us do. And we call that being the sacred. And we tend toward the sacred. We know that the sacred is good. And that's why St. Augustine, in his one of his most brilliant, and he has many brilliant turns of phrases, but this is one of the most brilliant turns of phrases, is he says, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And so, in a way, uh, what we're dealing with um, here is, is you know, um, uh, Augustine's recognition that we'll never be happy without perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. We'll never be happy without, in a sense, being vouchsafed with, uh, you know, what I would call a cosmically spiritual good and protected against cosmically spiritual evil. We're never going to be happy unless we're somehow in relationship with, um, you know, this, this uh, numinous experience that's within our, um, you know, consciousness that's present to us, fascinating us, drawing us to itself, drawing us to worship, drawing us, uh, you know, not just to fascination, but uh, to devotion, 
uh, toward it all, as it is, uh, you know, the holy other, as as uh, Rudolf Otto would call it, a W H O L L Y, uh, you know. And so, uh, at the end of the day, um, what we can, you know, say is, yeah, that that's, uh, you know, how we were built. We were ultimatizers. Like I said, the pagans, Plato and Aristotle, they recognize it just as much as uh, any, any Jew or Christian uh, recognize it. So, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, you know, you don't have to be religious. And, and what, you know, Thomas Aquinas in all sagacity said, you know, was, hey, you can ignore this thing. You can ignore God within your uh, conscious and subconscious um, mind. You can uh, ignore him. He's there. Uh, if you do ignore him, uh, you'll be emptier, you'll be more alienated, you'll be lonelier, you'll be guiltier, and you'll be filled with malaise. Um, that's what's going to happen to you. And if the American Psychiatric Association were measuring it, and they have, then you'll be more depressed and anxious. You'll have more familial tension, more substance abuse, and uh, more antisocial aggressivity, more suicides, and more suicidal contemplation. Great. So, you know, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can ignore or you can say, yes, I want to be part of this bigger, cosmic, mysterious, holy other. And that's why we are all instinctively religious people. I mean, why was it that up to 100 years ago, almost 100% of us were religious and, and or more, more like 250 years ago? Then we got, of course, the Enlightenment and all that stuff. And. Uh, we kind of pass away, but still to this day, 84% of the world is still religiously oriented because each and every one of us has the numinous within us, the call of the transcendent within us. All of us, you know, whether we uh, live in India or Antarctica or here in the United States, all of us have this sense of the mysterious and the sacred, uh, the, uh, you know, as opposed to the profane. All of us have within us the sense that there's cosmic evil and, and cosmic good out there, that there's something of immense, you know, a battle, struggle between these two uh, good and evil um, uh, dimensions out there, and that, you know, need to belong to the side of cosmic good versus cosmic evil, etc. Now, of course, um, you know, uh, um, as, as uh, Aquinas would say, you could ignore it if you want to, but you're never going to get away with it. I mean, your emotional health is going to decline. Your spiritual health will certainly decline. Your relational health will ultimately decline when your emotional health declines. And, of course, that's going to affect your marriages and family and everything else. So, um, you know, I just think, yeah, for God has made us for himself. And our hearts are going to be unhappy, restless, until they rest in him. I want to get practical here. I think we'll probably wrap it up with this question because I think this is one that that most people want to know is I think most people listen to this podcast and a lot of just most religious people, they say, yeah, you're right. Father, I agree with you. I, I acknowledge that true happiness comes from faith in God being in a religious community. But I tell you what, it ain't easy because I get pulled into the egocentric uh, happy, happiness. I get pulled into the materialistic happiness and I feel like I can't all of a sudden I find I'm very unhappy even though I do believe in God, I do even I even I go to mass each week or whatever, but I just it's just hard and, and I, I feel very unhappy anyway. So what is some practical advice for those of us who acknowledge what you're saying in theory is right, but yet we're we're have such difficulty practicing it in real life? Yeah. Let me break it up into two uh, you know um, answers. First, for those who don't have faith. I spent the majority of time in chapters 11 and 12 giving the scientific evidence for God, life after death from, you know, peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences and terminal lucidity, etc. Uh, looking at the evidence for God from contemporary cosmology, fine-tuning of universal concepts, looking at the evidence for God, too, uh, from a variety of other scientific sources, um, and, of course, presenting those statistics on the scientists. There's a lot of good reasons for it, but I spend 11 and 12 there because I think a lot of people say, I just can't get to level four. And if I don't have enough objective evidence, even contemporary scientific evidence for God, I'm not buying it. 
So that could be the cause of the unhappiness because they just can't get there. So I did spend chapters 11 and 12 giving that evidence specifically so that they could get to intellectual conversion is what it's called. And once they can get to intellectual conversion, they can then move to spiritual and moral conversion. But in order to answer your question, like I said, it's not enough to be spiritual in your room. If you're going to, first of all, be happy, you're going to have to make a move to start practicing, you know, um, a religion and to practice uh, prayer, personal prayer in your own life. Now, let me just say, make a quick distinction here. There is what we call a generalized unhappiness. So the free-floating anxiety and the continuous depression and anxiety and also the, um, you know, the uh, uh, kind of more general uh, malaise, that is what I'm talking about. In other words, if you want to get relief from, I mean, religious people just feel much less emptiness you know, uh, ontological and existential emptiness, right, then non-religious people, they just do. And they feel much less, um, you know, um, what I'm going to call alienation, right, um, uh, existential alienation, you know, I, or I'm, I basically feel not at home. I feel out of sorts, out of kilter uh, with the cosmos around me sort of feeling, uh, you know, uh, than, than uh, the non-religious people, I mean, than religious people do. They, they just feel more of it. And, and so there's a lot of generalized anxiety. So I call them emptiness, alienation, loneliness, malaise, and guilt. There's just no question religious people feel much less of that. Secondly, religious people feel more secure in their overall identity moment to moment. So they feel like at least there's God, even though they're situationally unhappy, which I'm going to talk about, as different from generalized unhappiness. Even though they may be situationally unhappy because of various stresses at work or stresses in the family, et cetera, et cetera, even there, they feel more secure. They feel that there is a solution, that God is somehow there present. Sometimes if you have great faith, you feel that everything's going to be all right, even though the situation seems rather bleak, et cetera, et cetera. So there is much less of that generalized unhappiness for religiously oriented people. Now, of course, um, religious and non-religious people have the same amount of situational unhappiness. There, you know, there's going to be some problem at work. This is going to cause situational unhappiness. Let's just call that a, a situational cross, right? And religious people have them, non-religious people have them. There's going to be situational problems in the family. Now, it is true that religious, you know, marriages are stronger, right? Religion is the second most predictable quality or characteristic guaranteeing satisfaction and longevity in marriage. The only one that religion is less than very slightly is the commitment at the very beginning of the marriage to make this a lifetime proposal and the desire to continue that lifetime commitment, um, you know, throughout one's life. So if there's a real commitment there at the beginning, you combine that with religion, you're likely to have a good uh, marriage, a, a longer marriage. Of, are you going to have fights in marriage? Yes, you're going to have fights in the marriage. But you're going to have, at the end of the day, you're going to have a basis where God is present, where your religion is present, where there's something... You know, if your prayer life is there, a desire to forgive, a desire to find, a, you know, a, a place where things can be worked out, etc. No question religion is extremely important there. So, again, a religious person, um, you know, will have um, that stronger family as well as that strength in relationship with God, the relationship to the sacred rather than the profane. So what can you do? to make your religion and family come to the fore, um, you know, when, you know, these moments of the cross, these situational unhappinesses uh, occur. I mean, the first thing, of course, is if you've got a regular prayer life going on, my thing would be to encourage family prayer. The second thing is I would definitely, 
Um, I, I've got a group of spontaneous prayers that I have mentioned. I believe it's in chapter 14 of the book. Uh, just look at those 10 spontaneous prayers that our prayers, when we really need help, some situational suffering has come up. And I've got those prayers kind of listed there. They're very easy to remember. Help, Lord, make good come out of whatever harm I might have caused. Lord, make some good come out of this terrible situation for me, my family, uh, for the church, for the kingdom of God. Make some good, maximum good come out of uh, this suffering. Uh, Lord, I offer this up for uh, the poor souls or for my family or for this guy I know who's suffering. Uh, again, Lord, I give up. You take care of it. Or just my prayer when you start feeling that depression foreboding. Lord, just push back the depression foreboding in the darkness. Just push it back. So all these things, uh, basically those spontaneous prayers, are very, very helpful. But communication with your family or in my case, communication with the people around me or my religious order, right? This, you know, that open communication, talking about what's going on, talking about needs, bringing God into the family and bringing God into the problems that we are meeting together with our family and our friends. Those uh, are real good habits that I talk about there uh, in the book. And, um, you know, again, um, uh, I think there's a, a lot of other things we can do religiously that I do recommend in chapters 14 through 17. So anyway, um, that's uh, in a nutshell what we can do to make use of our strong family, make use of our strong religious basis, and make use of the communication skills that we get from those relationships. And then when utilizing it, allow um, ourselves uh, to really, you know, when we get to the situational process, uh, we can rise above it through our faith. I have a whole book on this called, you know, The Light Shines On and the Darkness, Transforming Suffering Through Faith. But that's uh, a matter for a different um, uh, uh, time. Well, this, this has been great. I really do appreciate this because I do think this is something that most people generally feel like at different times a certain feeling of unhappiness, and they don't really recognize what's going on. So I think this is very good to kind of break it down because I think now when, like for me, I'll, give, I'll just give my own self as an example. When I feel like, okay, I've got, I've been on social media too long. I've been on, I've been mm -hmm. on X too long. And I do feel an anxiety that's kind of, kind of just almost like a base level anxiety oh, there. Oh, yeah. It's good to be like, okay, oh, this is my egocentric, whatever, you know, uh, happiness that has gotten out of kilter. So I need to adjust that. Uh, and I think and everybody has their own things and I know, you know, whatever they might be, but I know that's one for me. So I think this yeah. is a, a very good and helpful and productive, uh, practical conversation. So I do. Well, I, really yeah. I think it. really teachers could benefit from it and parents just to digest this material in this book, right? The four levels of happiness, um, you know, your path of personal flourishing. And Sophia Press, just get that book, read it. Don't read it to your kids. Digest it for yourself and sort of give it to your kids or to your students if you're a teacher or something. I, I am telling you, um, it will make a difference to them. I use this all the time in classrooms. It really is the fundamental difference. You can change a student's life and have them change their lives for themselves by just giving them a digested form uh, of this book. It, it, it would really make a difference for them. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I think it's a great point of parents getting this, reading this, not only to help themselves, but to help their children as they go yeah. through, especially to get to teen years and things like that and understand that. So, well, thank you, Father. I appreciate your time. Uh, this has been great. And I'll put up links to the to make sure you get the book, the Magic Center, so people can and check out all the stuff that you're doing. All right. Hey, thanks so much. It's been great being with you, Eric. And uh, uh, as I say, I'll talk to you later. That's right. Till next time, everybody. God love you.